me. Um, as Michelle said, I'm one of the project officers, um, so I may receive one of your grants, but um, I will uh, be helping to facilitate this quality assurance project plan 101 today. Um, with that, I'm actually going to just turn off my camera. Um, I want to say hi, but I don't always have the best connection from my house. OK. So in today's uh, webinar, we are going to go over a few different things. We're going to do a short overview, um, go through the different QAP elements that are required, go through the submittal, review and approval processes, and um, take questions. And this is also being recorded, um, which we will share afterwards and also share the guidance documents that we mentioned. So some of the housekeeping um, before we get into the weeds of quality assurance, I want to quickly go over some contacts you'll have um, from the EPA throughout your grant project period and your QAP process. Um, some of the titles you will hear mentioned today are the project officer or PO, the technical contact or TC, and the a quality assurance reviewer. Um, they may as well go by the DQAO, which is the designated quality assurance official. Um, you don't really need to remember that title. It, it'll just appear on, on one of your approval pages at some point, and uh, or they'll also be called the quality assurance reviewer. So you may hear some of these titles floating around. Um, the project officer will be your main contact at EPA for your grant and your first call for questions or help, anything grant related really. Um, and they will also be the person coordinating the QAP review between you, the grantee, and other EPA reviewers. Technical contacts are the technical experts in the field of your project and um, are there to provide any answers uh, that may be from detailed questions you have. Um, they also will play a role in the review of your work plan and your quality assurance project plan. Um, the QA reviewer is someone who has been delegated authority to review and approve QAPs and ensure QAPs are meeting all of the required elements and specifications needed. Uh, for the most part, the PO will be communicating with the TC and QA reviewer, and the QA reviewers will mainly only be involved during your QA discussions. Um, and then additionally, your project officer will coordinate a time to set up a, a project scoping meeting between you, the, uh, the PO, the TC, and the QA reviewer. And this is a precursor to drafting the QAP to make sure all the objectives and goals are clear. Um, we all understand the project and um, can ask additional questions up front, and uh, we can help you to start uh, guide the draft and where it should go. So yeah, the project officer will be reaching out to you to set up that meeting. So first things first, you may be asking yourself, what is a QAP? Um, this is the Quality Assurance Project Plan. Um, we'll just be calling it QAP for short. Um, throughout this webinar and in different emails that you'll see. Um, it's a formal planning document related to a project or program, and it describes the comprehensive detail, the necessary uh, quality assurance and quality control requirements and um, other technical activities that must be implemented to ensure that the results of the environmental information operations work uh, performed will satisfy the stated performance and acceptance criteria. And QAPS document how um, environmental information and operations are planned, implemented, documented, and assessed during the life cycle of a project or program. So why do you need one? Um, we have two things listed here. Um, CFR is the law that requires EPA to have a quality program. And the CIO listed there is EPA's Environmental Information Quality Assurance Policy. Um, under 2 CFR 1500.12, uh, quality assurance applies to all assistance agreements, so your grants, that involve environmentally related data operations, including environmental data collection, production, or use. Um, and then under EPA's policy, CIO 2105.1, um, this defines the minimum requirements for the quality program supporting the EPA environmental programs, 
um, unless superseded by statutory requirements. And environmental programs encompass the collection, production, evaluation, or use of environmental information by or for EPA and the design, construction, and operation of environmental technology by the EPA. So collectively, those activities are referred to as the environmental information operations. Um, and QAPs help to ensure that the project's environmental information is of known and documented quality, is scientifically valid, legally defensible, and appropriate for the intended use. Um, QAPs also help to maintain that the project and data is transparent and reproducible. So all projects require a quality assurance review to determine whether a QAP is required. But if you're wondering, is this applicable to me? Um, then you could check out this slide to see if uh, you use any of these action verbs in your work plan. Some of the projects or activities that are used with uh, in conjunction with these actions are sampling, ambient air conditions, research, statistical and economic analysis, um, computerized and mathematical models, um, secondary data. So that would be your um, existing data from literature, databases and previous studies, um, human and ecological health and environmental technology. Um, and if your project is not engaging in environmental information operations, then no QAP is required. Um, where QAPs are not generally needed would be guidance documents, education and outreach and videos from that, and uh, symposiums or conferences. But a lot of what EPA does uh, does need to be quality assured. So we will get into the QAP elements and what is required. So on the right hand side, we have a little snippet of the top of two different documents. Um, we have the requirements for EPA assistance agreements, um, which are specified in that QA R-5, um, EPA requirements for quality assurance project plans. And that document describes the quality assurance and quality control activities to be implemented um, to satisfy the performance criteria for the work involving environmental programs. And then breakdown of the requirements can be found in the document below it, EPA QA G-5, um, Guidance on Quality Assurance Project Plans. Uh, that provides guidance to the EPA employees and other organizations um, in developing QAPs and addresses all of the specifications in R-5. It's a little bit um, easier to read. And then the QAPs are broken down into four different groups of information. Um, we have Group A, Project Management. Group B, Data Generation and Acquisition. Group C, Assessment and Oversight. And Group D, Data Validation and Usability. Um, across these four groups, we uh, there will be a total of 24 elements we will go through. Um, and as stated earlier, we will pause um, periodically uh, after the two main groups. So after A, we'll pause because it's quite big. After B, we'll pause and then we'll lump C and D together um, and see if there are questions after those. And then we also um, recognize that QAPs may not be a one size fits all um, solution, which is why the EPA applies something called the graded approach. Um, this means that the level of detail in each QAP will vary according to the nature of the work being performed, uh, the intended use of the data, and the degree of confidence needed in the quality of the results. Uh, the graded approach allows the availability of resources and unique needs of an organization to be taken into consideration. Um, as a result of this, it may be acceptable for a qualitative discussion instead of a quantitative in some different areas or that a particular element um, are not applicable for the project. And if you are provided a template for your type of project, it will most likely note if there are elements which do not need to be filled out. Um, nevertheless, elements that are not applicable should still include a brief statement to why they're not relevant. Um, and on the left hand side here, uh, we have an example from the air monitoring guidebook. Um, and it's just showing that depending on 
uh, which level of monitoring you're doing, um, this one through four, uh, which elements would be applicable for that. So now we can get into group A, project management. The project management group um, addresses the basic area of project management, and it includes the project history and objectives, roles and responsibilities of the participants, um, and these elements ensure that the project has a defined goal, that the participants understand the goal and the approach to be used, and that the planning outputs have been documented. A1 is our first element of all 24, and it's pretty simple, the title and approval page. It identifies key project officials and documents the approval of the QAP. Um, signatures indicate the approval of the plan and the commitment to follow the procedures noted in it. And the names of who will sign um, and their positions should be included, such as the QA manager and the project manager. Um, and when it's submitted, it should be unsigned, but uh, at this point, and then afterwards, you'll receive a notification that it's ready to be signed. Um, but in the beginning, you can just leave it unsigned and note who those personnel are. Other key individuals who may need to sign um, could be a field operations manager, a lab manager, and any state or federal partners, um, people that it's important to have their approval as well for you. And then on the APA side, um, we'll have the project officer, technical contact, and QA reviewer. And uh, depending on how workloads shake out, um, it may be two people fulfilling those three roles or maybe three people. Um, so during the scoping meeting, uh, we'll see what kind of project you have and uh, where everyone's workloads lie and let you know who to fill in for uh, those roles on the approval page. A2 is the table of contents, and it does what most table of contents do. It allows the reader to locate different information sections and visualize how the plan is laid out. Um, if the QAP author prefers to divide the plan into different sections other than the 24 elements, this is where a table should be inserted to cross-reference the um, information and uh, where it could be found. And then SOPs should also be included in the appendices here. Um, and a document control should be included on each page of the plan and include the information. Um, so it, below is an example of um, this document control, um, and it's often used as the header. And then if this is a revised quality assurance project plan, um, a revisions history section is recommended to summarize the changes made and the date. Um, this should be placed between the title and approval page in the table of contents or at the end of the QAP. And an example of that is um, on the right hand side here. Next is the distribution list. Um, this should list all the people and their organization who needs to receive a copy um, of the QAP and any subsequent revisions as well as anyone responsible for the implementation of the projects. Um, at a minimum, it should include those on the approval page. And then others that it may include are the field team leaders, data reviewers, uh, subcontractors. Um, sometimes you see volunteers or other partners listed as well. Um, and then typically either the phone number or email is also provided. A4, the project organization, um, it should identify individuals and organizations participating in the project and discuss their roles and responsibilities. This should include the principal data users, decision makers, project quality assurance manager, and all people responsible for the implementation. This section should describe that the QA manager is independent of the unit generating the data, um, we know that in some cases of smaller organizations, this may be hard to separate um, as one person can wear multiple hats. So if that's the case, um, we will work with you to see how we could kind of get around this or create an alternate way to have um, not the QA uh, be the same person, the QA manager be the same person who's generating the data. 
Um, and then this should also identify the person responsible for maintaining the official approved QAP and include an organizational chart. Um, that's very helpful in quickly identifying lines of authority and reporting and communication. So um, here's an example of an organizational chart. It's a bit in, in depth, um, but it's a good example. A5, problem definition and background. Um, it gives an overview of the problem to be solved and important background information and is the foundation of the whole project. It describes why the project needs to be done and what needs to be done um, so that all people involved clearly understand the underlying purpose of the project and that the project design will accomplish this purpose. It includes historical context and background for initiating the project as well. Um, it should have an identification of your goals and objectives, so that would include decisions to be made, actions to be taken or outcomes expected from the project. And it should identify regulatory information, applicable criteria, action limits, etc. that's necessary to the project. A6 project description. Um, this is a high level summary of how the project will address the problem previously described and connecting what is needed to how it will be obtained. So this section summarizes all the work to be performed, products to be produced, and an implementation schedule. Um, the geographic location is detailed here and um, maps are included as appropriate. For the work schedule, um, please list the critical points in the project, such as the start and end dates, the sampling schedule, when analysis is to be completed and reports written, um, and if the project schedule is set by funding or regulatory deadlines, that should be included as well. Additionally, this section will note any resource and time constraints that are applicable, such as which season monitoring needs to take place in, or if you have a smaller staff or uh, different grant constraints. A7, quality objectives and criteria. Um, this section discusses the quality objectives for the project and the performance criteria to achieve those objectives. Um, this should be really tailored to the needs of your project. So quantitative performance and acceptance criteria are often expressed as DQIs or data quality indicators. Uh, this includes precision, bias, accuracy, representative, representativeness, um, comparability, completeness, and sensitivity. DQIs are common for the traditional field sampling studies. Um, and then qualitative criteria are generally more appropriate for projects relying on existing data. Um, and you may include applicability, soundness, uncertainty, clarity, and completeness um, in those criteria. A8, special training and certification. Um, this is where you would identify any specialized training or certifications needed, uh, how that training is going to be provided, who is responsible for assuring that this is met, where um, the information is documented, whether that's like a cloud service or a paper file in your office, um, and how long the record should be kept. It should also include anything that's non-routine training or certifications necessary for the successful completion of the project. So if there's certain security clearances that are needed to obtain a confidential file or expertise in uh, a code language or a lab certification. This is our last of the group A, documentation and records. Um, A9 describes the management of project documents, information and records, including uh, the QAP. Um, so just to note that the management of data will be covered in B10 data management, but some areas may look like they will overlap. Um, information that may be included in the data report package or list of files um, could be raw data, field logs, quality assurance check results, problems encountered, databases or literature, and sample preparation logs, um, audits, and final reports. 
And then um, we could also note where project information should be kept and for how long and plans for electronic backups. Um, and then you should also include how people on the distribution list will receive the most current copy of the QAP and who is responsible for that. OK, so we have a quick poll question um, that my colleagues will help to facilitate. And hopefully it keeps you awake. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. We just put the poll question in the chat for everyone to answer. Um, so which element contains a list of people who should receive a copy of the approved QAP? Um, so we'll take uh, just a few, a few minutes um, or a few seconds to answer this question. All right, so it looks like we got a decent number of people who've already answered the poll question. So the correct answer is um, B, distribution list. So um, like from what Melanie said, that's the list that contains everyone who should receive um, a copy of the approved QAP. So this is the, the section and the element that this will go into. So this is the, the last part of Group A. So I think we're going to open it up to any questions. Um, I don't think we saw I saw any questions in the chat, but um, if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and um, ask it for us. Hi there, quick question. Um, I saw that there's sort of a description of where sampling will take place and, and things like that. And I'm wondering how to handle that at the beginning of the project where the determination of those locations is part of a later step. Um, I, I correct me if I heard the question wrong, but um, so you have certain locations and you're trying to determine if that should be talked about in the beginning of the QAP process or if that should be developed as the QAP is being developed. Yeah, so part of the project, it's a it's a community wide project. And so part of the work is to determine the best locations for air quality sensors. Um, and so I'm just wondering how to if that's something we just update later. Um, I think that's a little specific to your project and we may be able to flesh it out better in a scoping meeting um, and help determine if uh, we could kind of put together if there's any way to put together the locations or just best how to represent that in the QAP that uh, the community may be involved in helping to determine those locations. OK, thank you. OK. All right, are there any other questions before we move on? All right, it looks like some people in the chat are in the same situation as, as well. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, Melanie, we can we can keep going with the presentation though. Good question, thank you. OK, Group B is the data generation and acquisition section. It's also a pretty um, big section with 10 different elements in it. Um, so the elements in this group address all aspects of project design and implementation. Implementation of these elements ensure that appropriate methods for sampling, measurement and analysis, um, data collection or generation, data handling and QC activities are, um, em are employed and are properly documented. B1 sampling process design. Uh, this element describes the project's data collection or research design and explains the how and why to ensure that the appropriate data are collected for the project. Um, you should describe and justify the design strategy, indicating the area, volume, or time period represented by a sample. 
You should detail um, the type and total number of sample types or runs expected and needed. Indicate how sampling sites will be located and what to do if the location becomes inaccessible. So um, for that question, this may be a section where that's expanded on a little bit more. Um, you can briefly describe how samples will be obtained and treated before shipping to the lab for analysis and sampling schedules. And you should explain if any sample types are critical or are secondary to the study. Um, and then additionally indicate uh, sources of variability and how it should be reconciled with the project information, um, whether that's seasonal differences, uh, security or topography, stuff like that. And then reviewers will look to see what the rationale of the sample design is and uh, what the intended number, um, if the intended number of samples collected um, will provide enough data to answer and meet the project objectives. Um, and then if you're using regulatory monitors, you may need to include additional citations to meet those requirements. B2 sampling methods. Um, this describes the procedures for collecting samples and identifies the sampling methods and equipment. Um, you should identify all of the sampling SOPs or standard, standard operating procedures and equipment um, that's appropriate for the project and any support facilities to be used. Um, and then indicate how each sample or matrix type should be collected. And then you should have a discussion. Um, the discussion should address what to do if a failure occurs, who's responsible for the corrective action, and uh, how it will be documented and determined to be effective. And then in this section, you can also list your process for um, preparation and decontamination of different sampling equipment. B3, sampling, handling, and custody. Um, B3 describes efforts to have each collected sample retain its original physical form and chemical composition from collection to disposal. Um, the section describes the requirements for sampling, handling, and custody in the field, the lab, and the transport, and the maximum holding times. Um, sample handling includes packaging, shipment from the site, and storage at the lab, if you're using a lab. And then examples uh, of sample labels, custody forms, and sample custody logs should be included. An example of a sample label is on the right-hand side. Um, not for an air project, but just a, a label in general. Um, and then I wanted to add in the beginning of the group B, but I forgot that uh, this area is like all, all the group B is where we may see some of the variability of what's applicable for your project. Um, so definitely not all of these elements will be applicable um, or not necessarily, but it's still important to go over it just in case. Uh, B4 identifies the procedures to analyze samples and um, what performance criteria is needed to support any decisions being made. Uh, it should identify all the analytical SOPs that should be followed or include them in the appendices. Um, if it's an EPA standard method to be followed, it should be cited um, with the number and date. The section should identify equipment or instrumentation needed. Specify any specific method performance criteria. Identify procedures to follow when failures occur and the individual responsible for the corrective actions. Um, sample disposal procedures. And state the requested lab turnaround times needed. And um, method validation information and SOPs for anything that's non-standard. B5, quality control. Um, this is where you should list all of the checks you're going to follow to assess or demonstrate reliability um, and confidence in the information. So for each type of sampling, analysis, or measurement technique, um, you should identify the QC activities which should be used. Um, it could be like a field blank or calibration check and at what frequency. Uh, the section should detail what should be done when control limits are exceeded and how effectiveness uh, of those actions will be determined and documented. 
Um, it should also identify procedures and formulas for calculating applicable QC statistics, which off which could be for precision bias, outliers, or missing data. B6 covers how project personnel will know what that the equipment will work properly when needed. Um, so this section lists out equipment or systems that will be used during the project. Um, what will be done to test, inspect, and maintain the instruments and equipment. Uh, you should identify where critical spare parts will be located. Um, and then all the testing, inspection, and maintenance, how often this is going to be done and who's responsible for it. And then if you have an SOP um, that contains this information, uh, that may be cited or, or attached as well. B7, instrument equipment, calibration, and frequency. This section identifies all tools, gauges, equipment, and instruments that should be calibrated and the frequency for this calibration. It describes how calibrations should be performed and documented, indicating test criteria and standards for certified equipment. Um, if there's no nationally recognized standards, um, it should document the basis for the calibration. And then this section also identifies how deficiencies should be resolved and documented. B8 inspection acceptance um, for supplies and consumables. B8 documents your system for having the right critical fields and lab supplies and consumables available. Um, it should list the critical supplies, noting the supply source the procedures for tracking, storing and receiving the materials, and it should describe how and by who, uh, whom the supplies and consumables um, will be inspected and accepted for the use in the project. This section should state the acceptance criteria for those supplies and consumables. Um, an example of the certain supplies and consumables you may include would be filters or cartridges for air monitoring. B9 is our non-direct measurements, um, and this may be a bigger section for uh, some projects than others if you're heavily relying on existing data. Um, this section addresses data obtained from existing data sources, um, not directly measured from the project. Um, so it should identify the type of data needed from non-measurement sources um, along with the acceptance criteria for their use and define the intended use and describe any limitations of the data. Um, data may be qualitative or quantitative here, um, such as photographs or topographical maps produced outside of the project, information from published literature, background into a, a facility or state files, um, existing sampling and analytical files from a previous effort. Uh, and then the acceptance criteria could mean from a peer review study or um, has measurement process limits. So these would be from other sources. B10 is data management, and this is the last of the group B. This element gives an overview of the management of the data generated throughout the whole project. It describes the data management scheme from the generation in the field to the final use and storage. It discusses the procedures for record keeping, uh, document control system, and data storage and retrieval um, from electronic media. It discusses methods and equipment for detecting or correcting errors and preventing data loss. And it describes procedures to demonstrate the acceptability of hardware and software configurations that you may be using. Um, and should identify who's responsible for the data management. And we have another poll question. All right, so for this poll question, we have which element details procedures to follow when a failure occurs? Um, so we just put the poll question in the chat, so feel free to take the next a uh, few seconds, a few minutes to answer this question.
Okay, so in the interest of time, we're just going to go ahead and go with the answer for this question. So um, the element that would detail what to do when a failure occurs in the project and the sampling process is the um, analytical methods. Um, so this section, you would um, detail the procedures that you would do whenever something happens during, during the project, any type of failure. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and open it up to any questions regarding any of the elements or um, anything regarding Group B. Does anyone have any questions? All right, um, hearing none, um, Melanie, I'll go ahead and pass it off to you. Um, if anyone has any questions that pops up, you know, after this meeting, um, you can always reach out to your project officer um, with any questions, of course. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move into Group C. Um, this is a pretty small group. It only has two elements in it. Um, C is the assessment and oversight, and um, the elements in this group address the activities for assessing the effectiveness of the implementation of the project and the associated QA and QC activities. Um, the purpose of the assessment um, is to assure that the QA project plan is implemented as prescribed. C1, assessment and response actions. Um, this element gives information concerning how a project's activities will be assessed during the project um, to ensure that the QA, um, that the QAP is being implemented as approved. It lists the number, frequency, and type of assessment activities that should be conducted with the approximate dates. It identifies the person who will conduct the assessments and should note their, their authority to issue any stop work orders. Um, it should describe how assessment findings and corrective actions should be reported and to who. For field or lab project assessments, um, it may consist of a readiness review, surveillance or technical system audit of field, lab or data management activities. And then for an existing data project, uh, it may assess data to determine suitability for their intended use and to identify whether project specifications were met. C2, reports to management. Um, this section documents how management will be kept informed of project oversight and assessment activities and findings. Um, this should not be redundant of the Section A9 documents and records, um, but focuses on the manager's quality assurance information access. Um, it should also identify what project quality assurance status reports are needed, whether that's an assessment report or calibration report or others, and the frequency. Um, it should also identify who should write those reports and who should be receiving the information. Group, oh, yep, so we just finished C, <laughs> very quick. Uh, group D is also pretty small. Um, it's the data validation and usability group. Um, these address the QA activities that occur after the data collection or generation phase of the project is completed. Um, implementation of these elements ensure that the data conform to the specified criteria, um, thus achieving the project objectives. D1, data review, validation, and verification. Um, yeah, it, it lists your criteria to accept, reject, or qualify the project data. Uh, and this will differ by um, how your organization, uh, how, how rigorous or independent it should be. Um, and then the data review is ensuring that the data has been um, recorded, transmitted, and processed correctly. Um, checks should include uh, looking for data looking at the data entry or calculation and transcription errors. Um, it's a completeness check as well um, if there's any data gaps or loss. D2, 
verification and validation methods. Um, it identifies the methods or processes for verifying and then validating the project information. So it describes a process for data verification and validation, providing the SOPs um, and indicating if there is data validation software that should be used, um, who's responsible for verifying and validating the different components of the project information, um, such as the chain of custody forms or calibration information. Um, and it identifies issue resolution process method and uh, the individual responsible for conveying these results to the data users. And then this would be our last uh, group D element, reconciliation and user requirements. This element is to describe how you will evaluate the validated data to see if it answers the original questions asked, um, meaning the data quality objectives. And it describes how limitations on data um, use should be reported to the data users, such as if the data quality indicators do not meet the performance criteria previously stated. Um, and this is the final assessment of the data quality and the culmination of the entire QA process for the project. And our last poll. All right, so for our last poll question today is going to encompass um, information from Group C and Group D since they're both relatively smaller um, sections in the QAP. So which element should describe how a project activity will be assessed to determine alliance with the approved QAP? So again, we'll take a few seconds for everyone to put in their answers. All right, so it looks like everyone um, got the correct answer for this poll question. So the correct answer is assessment and response action. So element C1, so this is the element that will um, determine how well the project activities are in accordance with the with the approved WAP. Okay, so does anyone have any overall questions for um, group C and group D, those elements? We do have a couple um, more general questions in the chat. Um, the first being, um, what is the timeline on when the CLAP needs to be completed and can other parts of the current project be worked on without an approved CLAP? Uh, we will go over that in our next section. Perfect. Um, and the next question a couple of people um, have asked is, is, will there be a um, CLAP template available? Yes, um, I guess there is, I, I'll go over some of the tools that we'll provide also um, in the next section. Um, and if, if you're doing a specific project relating to sensors or if you're, Using regulatory monitors, there's different templates available um, for those as well. Um, they will, I'll go over some of the different webinars coming up and touch upon that also. All right, if we don't have any other questions for Group C or D, I think we can move on to the next mm -hmm. section. Okay, yeah, I think um, some of those questions we'll address in this next section, yeah. but. If not, please um, ask them again. <laughs> so QAP approval. So um, we'll go into the submittal. Um, 
I don't know how many of you are first time uh, EPA grantees, first time federal grantees, um, or you are veterans to the process. Um, but when your grant is made, you will receive something that is your award document. Um, and in the programmatic terms and conditions, this is all the way at the bottom of your award document. Um, there will be a sentence regarding uh, when the QAP must be submitted by. So it'll be something along the lines of the recipient must submit the QAP uh, 60 or 90 days after the grant award and no more than 90 or 120 days uh, after the grant award. So you must submit, uh, yeah, it, it'll specify that in your award document um, and your project officer will go through those terms and conditions with you um, and we'll be able to point that out as well. And then all projects and tasks involving the generation or use of environmental data uh, need to have an approved co-op prior to the start of environmental data generation or use. Um, and wait one second. That's popping up. <laughs> um, so yeah, you, you must have this quap in place before any of that QA work starts. It must be approved before that. Um, EPA's Region 5 office uh, has a goal of reviewing and approving within 60 days of your first submittal, um, but this only includes the time in EPA hands. So our first kind of target is 30 days for the first review, and sometimes there's multiple reviews needed. Um, so that's why we allow for 60 days from our side. Um, but often it could be much longer uh, due to different reviews and times that the grantee needs to have to uh, update the QAP. Um, when you're ready to submit the QAP for full review, you may send it to your project officer who will coordinate uh, the review with the other um, personnel responsible. Um, if you need a meeting before, um, you may request that and or if you want to send in a draft, just please indicate that it's a draft. Um, you're just looking for guidance, um, but if it's a submittal, please indicate that you're looking for a submittal with a full review and approval. Here's a little diagram of our review process. Um, so the first point here in blue is the QAP is submitted um, and then it will go to our staff for review. It's reviewed by multiple people. Uh, the, some of the people we talked about earlier that um, designated quality assurance official, the technical contact and the project officer. And we will be looking to uh, ensure that the QAP is scientifically sound and complete and recommend different areas of improvement. And then uh, QAPs are approved for up to five years or until the project period ends, whichever comes sooner. Uh, additionally, QAPs need to be reviewed by the grantee on an annual basis and certified to the EPA, most likely just to your project officer in an email, um, if there's no changes needed or if there's minor revisions or major revisions. So major revisions, um, such as you're like significantly changing your sampling design, um, will require the QAP to go through the review process again. But for the most part, just sending an email, um, whether it's a matter of revision or no revisions, um, is good and most common. So once we receive it, we'll determine if it's an acceptable uh, QAP to be approved. If it is not, it will follow that no chain and we will do a cycle of sending you comments, um, having revisions come in. You can submit it again. We'll go through the comments and um, we also can set up meetings to discuss those comments. Um, sometimes that helps to clarify it a little bit better than just looking at them in an email or on the Word document. Um, so if that's helpful for you, we will be more than happy to uh, debrief those comments. Once it's acceptable, um, you will get a notification from us that it's ready to be signed. So uh, you will sign the QAP first and then send it back to us. EPA will sign and then our signature finalizes it and um, 
makes it effective that date and we will send it back to you in which you can start to implement the project. And then some of the essential tools we will be sending out um, along with the link to this webinar um, is this R-5 requirements document, the guidance document. Um, we will send you the general QAP checklist that we use to review it. Um, it may be helpful once you are done writing your QAP to kind of compare it and see if um, you know it checks all of the boxes to you. Um, if you're missing something, it may be you know helpful to fill that in before sending it um, to make all the reviews a bit faster. And any other guidance documents that may be applicable to your project, um, we won't include that with these right now. But once we have a scoping meeting with you, um, we will be able to get a better sense of what your project is and say it's related to sensors. We will be able to send you a bunch of different guidebooks and toolboxes of uh, information to help you with it. And then lastly, just a reminder, we have two other webinars coming up, um, one focusing on sensors, that's uh, Thursday, December 8th, and one focusing on um, monitoring on December 15th. And those will go into much further detail of those two um, topics. This session today really is just an overarching uh, QAP overview and um, hits on the general requirements. Um, and if you fall into a sensor category or a monitoring requirement category, um, be sure to attend those. Um, and that is all I have for you right now. So if there's any remaining questions, I'd be happy to take them. We do have a couple additional uh, questions in the chat. Um, I see one was from Mark Templeton. It looks like he has his hand up. So let's see if that's the same question or a different one. Uh, feel free to uh, ask your question, Mark. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I, uh, I believe a slide or four or two, you sort of said that the, there was a kind of a uh, time for the the quap to be provided like 60 between 60 and 90 days after the uh, I think grant of the award and so I was just trying to get clarity in terms of what is that start date uh, presumably it's not a month ago it's uh, I would gather it's after the agreement is signed but I just wanted some clarity on when the clock is starting uh, on the quap I think I think you said slide four but you mean like towards the approval right um, no, I thought you said that there was a time period for when it was kind of due to be submitted. Yeah, th there is, um, and that will be specified in your terms and conditions, which is different for each grantee on your word document. Um, but in general, it's about 60 or 90 days um, after your grant is awarded um, that it should be submitted. But um, yeah, it'll also say definitely like like a no later than X time as well. Um, in general, I would recommend getting your clap to us as early as possible. Um, probably 90 days before you want to start implementing the work um, just to allow for different uh, review times and any revisions that may be needed. If it's a particularly complicated project involving regulatory monitoring and sensors and community input. And, uh, you know, that may be a big quap um, to review. And um, yeah, it, it may just take some time. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I guess because I'm, I'm a lawyer, I'm just uh, focus on the specific words. So <laughs> when, you say, when you say awarded, what does awarded mean? Does award or what does 16 to 90 days, I think you said after the grant is, uh, Right. So there will be people, people got notified, but notified mm -hmm. is not the same as awarded. Is awarded when the agreement is signed, or has it been awarded thirty days whenever people got the notice a month ago? I guess what I'm that's I'm trying to understand. Yep. The, yep. So when the, when the, what's that start? What's that start 
that then it's 60 to 90 ish days after. That's what I'm trying to. I'm sorry if I'm not being clear myself. No, you're good. Um, so I don't know if any of the project officers could quickly pull up an award document um, that they have, but um, just as an example, but there will be you will get an email that says this is your notification of award. And that means that it was signed by our grants management official. They make that commitment of funds um, in you know a, a paper format, a legal con a grant. Um, there will be a, a PDF of that award. It spells out um, how much funding is provided to who for what project. Um, it spells out various other things like your budget and uh, different again the terms and conditions of the federal grant um, in the top right corner of the award document there will be a box that says award date and that was the date that our uh, award official signed it um, and it, it will be based off of let me backtrack really quick that that is the date that it was signed and made official but then there's a different section that's your project period listed so it will be the 60 or 90 days after the start of your project period. So whether that is January 1st, 23 of 2023, um, it will be that 90 days after. So look at the project period. Uh, Melanie, we have another question in the chat um, from Brandy asking, does the CLAP include the quality assurance statement that was submitted as part of the grant proposal? Um, I, I don't think so. Um, I will be frank that I haven't seen the quality assurance statements um, that hasn't been made available to myself yet. Um, but I, I don't believe that I think it's just it was probably a statement of whether or not you will be needing a quality assurance plan. But I don't know if um, someone from monitoring or, or Michelle, if you know any more about that statement. Melanie, this is Michael um, from the monitoring section and, and the grant, <clears throat> the RFA or RFP soliciting projects did require a quality assurance statement to be submitted as part of the application. And so we should be receiving those once the regions receive the full grant applications that were submitted to US EPA. Um, but that statement will likely not need to be included verbatim in the in the quality assurance project plan. But the quality assurance project plan is a, is a much larger expansion of your intended quality assurance that you intend to do to support your project. Thank you. I see there's a hand up if you want to jump on the mic. Hi, all. Thank you for providing this initial webinar. I appreciate it. Uh, my quick question is that you mentioned that you cannot start any of your data collection activities until the co-op is signed. Um, can you purchase the equipment that's going to be needed before the co-op is signed? Or would that be considered data collecting activities? It is not a data collection activity. Um, in, it wouldn't, it's not prohibited to purchase equipment before the co-op is signed. Um, you just may want to be pretty sure that this is the exact equipment that you need. Uh, sometimes okay. when we review co-ops, um, we realize that the grantee is not purchasing what they should to support um, their objectives, or you know maybe they're purchasing a certain piece of equipment and don't realize that it doesn't monitor for what they're looking for. Um, so I would say like, probably at least go through the scoping meeting um, before purchasing, or at least have a conversation with your project officer to ensure that that's the correct uh, piece of equipment for you. OK, our, our, our process is going to take a while to go through the purchasing process, so the sooner we're able to begin that process, um, the better. That's why I'm asking the question. Yep, understandable. 
Thank you. And I know um, many of you um, will be um, collecting data using air sensors. So just another plug for our webinar next week, where we will talk about sensors specifically, um, including you know, some of the things that you should be looking for and evaluating when you're choosing um, which sensor to use. So that should hopefully help as well. Are there any additional questions um, from the chat we missed or that anyone has? You know, it's a lot to take in, um, but looking at the. The checklist and looking at the requirement documents um, will be very beneficial to you, I believe. Hi, I actually have one more question. Um, do you happen to have like online or somewhere available sample co-ops that involve community engagement as well as use of sensors? And I know about the air sensor citizen science, you know, toolbox as well mm -hmm. as the um, quality assurance guidebook for sensors, but just trying to get a uh, sample documentation. Yep. So um, we have an air sensor template that we've developed in ARD here, or air and radiation division. Um, they'll probably touch upon it in that sensor webinar, um, but it does go through um, different options for what level of detail you need. So if that is more of like an education outreach project, it'll give you uh, different options to choose from in that template. Or if you're going to do something a little bit more um, intense, whether that's co-location or personal exposure monitoring with sensors, um, it should be able to give you those options as well. Okay. And are, the, are those documents available, like readily available now that I can go somewhere and find them? Um, we can have someone send it to you. Okay, that'd be very helpful. Thank you very much. Yep, no problem. Melanie, this is Michael. I just want to clarify with the last question. Uh, the co-op is really focused on um, collection of data or or use of data, and the the citizen or the community engagement may or may not need to be included in the, in the co-op, depending on whether you're um, you're gathering information from them that will be used in the, the the work that you proposed. Yeah, and I think, and I'm sorry, I know, like, I feel like I'm monopolizing things now, but um, we likely will be because we're using health metric data to make a determination of where we're placing our monitors, and we're also using community input of where the sensors and the monitoring station are going. Okay. Um, so, kind of based on like one of the previous slides with additional data that may be needed. Um, we have maps that have already been generated about pediatric asthma rates, as well as some other health data and social vulnerability that will be used to inform the location of our sensors. Great. Thanks for the clarification. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Anything else? Right, well, I will stay on the line for another five, ten minutes um, in case if anyone wants to have uh, any conversations or talks. Um, other than that, I think it seems like people's questions have wrapped up. And stop the recording, Rachel.